It may not affect all our lives in the same way, but there is no doubt about it, we are living in the digital age. While some of us might find that overwhelming at times, the fact is new technology has also enabled science and industry to come up with some truly amazing innovations. Welcome to this new edition of Eco Africa. I am Chris Elems. And I am Sandra Twinovdio. You make a very good point, Chris. And of course, here on the show, we take special interest in those developments that make our world cleaner and greener. We've got a few good examples of that on today's program. So here's a quick look at what is coming up shortly. High tech that is helping forests recover in Ivory Coast. Biodegradable packaging made from seaweed. And Rwanda's next generation of environmentalists. The climate crisis is forcing us to rethink how we do just about everything, even traditional practices like farming. As once seemingly abundant resources dwindle, there is an urgent need to grow crops more efficiently and sustainably. Our first report comes from right here in Uganda. <music> Aaron Kiaga carefully inspects the fruits of his labor. For decades, he and his family have been growing coffee in central Uganda's Liweru district. It hasn't made him rich, but he's been able to support his family. Now climate change is making business even more difficult. In the past, coffee used to yield without pests or long time we got rain at the the time. Time. These days, so, rain is rain is unpredictable. unpredictable. And when it stops, the coffee is not the dry smells. The coffee industry is one of Uganda's most important economic sectors. The African country exports over 250,000 tons annually, making it one of the world's top 10 coffee producers. 99% of it is grown on small farms like Aaron Kiaga's. Some 5 million Ugandans depend on the coffee harvest, either directly or indirectly. But changes in the climate are making things harder for Aaron Kiaga. Researchers and government officials are also alarmed because rising temperatures are increasing the amount of pests and diseases that destroy crops. An insect which was not very serious at some point can become detrimental just because one or two degrees of uh, uh, Celsius in increased, either by cutting trees or due to the climate change. That means if, let's say, the, uh, from egg to, to egg hatching, if it is taken seven days, the normal temperature, with one degree centigrade, it might take four days. That means the, li the, the, the life cycle of those insect, the insects that are affecting you will increase by two or three folds. With his coffee crop under threat, one solution Aaron Kiaga is trying out is planting more trees. In the open area, coffee is exposed to excess heat and its crop quality is not as good as when it is grown under a tree shade. Planting trees for better harvests is a concept known as agroforestry. It's agriculture that harnesses the symbiotic relationship between trees, crops and animals. Aaron Kiaga is taking part in the robust program which is being tested on 50 plots of land to determine how the coffee harvest can be protected from climate change. The EU has funded the project with 4.5 million euros. It is a typical African uh, way of farming system. Wherever you go in African soil, uh, farmers use diversified cropping system. You see trees, you see chicken, you see very, very diverse. So now we are bringing that same uh, traditional farming system with a designed uh, approach so that the farmers are benefiting more from it. According to the French development organization CIRAD, 50,000 coffee farmers will benefit from the robust program by 2025. In addition to their work in the field, robust provides scientific support while cooperating with EU research and development programs as well as various Ugandan institutions. 
On a voulu promouvoir dans le cadre du projet euh, We wanted to promote la formation the scientific training of many students de, within de the framework of the project. Ce qui fait qu'on a recruté euh, Which is why we recruited de many thesis, PhD and MSc students who will help us implement the project in the field. À, à mettre en œuvre le projet sur le terrain. And these students, et, euh, together with scientists from the institutions, will organize et, et run a whole network of plants. Euh, vont organiser et animer tout un réseau de, de parcelles. Using the symbiotic relationship between trees and coffee plants to improve soil quality and strengthen resistance is one goal. Another is ensuring that the plants are better suited to future climates by breeding new strains of the robust coffee variety. At Uganda's National Coffee Research Institute, cuttings of these new strains are being given to farmers for cultivation. When the breeding section does the improvement, improvement to different traits, resistance to diseases, yield, and so on, those materials have to have enough numbers so that we avail them to farmers. Specifically for the robust project, they are trying to develop the drought-resistant varieties. The robust program is still in its infancy. If it proves effective over the next four years, Fabrice Pinard hopes that it can set a new precedent for sustainable coffee farming around the world. The potential is enormous. It's not meant to stay within the borders of Uganda, and it's meant to be known, and it will be, I would say, open access for everybody. Ça veut This dire means que that initially it will concern all the countries, temps, il va for example, in Africa, tous les pays, that grow par robust coffee, and this is quite du, fast du because robusta. it starts in Uganda and Et ends in West Africa, in Côte d'Ivoire and the coast. So this en program will be open to everyone. Donc, uh, ce package sera ouvert à tout le monde. It will be some time before the project produces scientific results, but some farmers are already reporting the positive impact that tree shade has on their crops. The animals owned by Aaron Kiaga's family are also reaping the benefits. They seem to enjoy the trees just as much as the coffee plants. Agroforestry may be making gains, but it can't be practiced without healthy woodlands. Unfortunately, millions of hectares of forest are still being destroyed every single year. Ivory Coast is one country that has been devastated by deforestation. But all is not lost. Digital technology could very well save the day. Valter Yao Kofi was hoping to become a lawyer. But after completing his studies, he decided to become a farmer instead. In 2016, he launched his company Champ Pivoire against the advice of his parents and devoted his time to growing food. Digital technology has always been at the forefront of his work. He uses apps to get advice on optimal farming methods. Right now he's getting some tips for his rice field. These tools have played a key role in his career choice. He sees himself as more of an agricultural entrepreneur or agripreneur than a farmer. With these apps and with the internet, we're able to find solutions to the problems we encounter, and that has been a huge plus for us, the new generation of agripreneurs. Agriculture is a leading sector in Ivory Coast, representing nearly a third of GDP. But global warming and deforestation are weighing on the environment. Could digital technology revolutionize the sector? The company Investive is convinced it can and is trying to preserve the country's remaining forests with precision agriculture. They want to make a clear distinction between protected forest and farmland with the help of drones. Could it fall on our heads by accident? <laughs> The photos taken by the drone show the farmers exactly what belongs to them and what belongs to the forest, where they're not allowed to fell trees. He has his map and knows he owns one hectare. He won't go beyond that and encroach on the forest. Back in the village, the footage is analysed and clearly shows the boundaries between the forest and the fields. 
You can work anywhere in this area, but you can't enter here. This is a small revolution. Previously, he would have had to walk around his field with GPS to obtain this data. Work that would normally take us two or three hours now only takes us one hour. So that's really good. So far, few people in Ivory Coast have access to such data. While almost everyone has a cell phone today, less than half the population has internet access. It's often too expensive, especially for farmers. Walter Yaukofi is trying to popularize the use of apps among farmers. He explains the wide scope of opportunities that the internet presents. But he knows a lot has to change to achieve real success. It would be good if we could have free internet zones in the villages where people can get wireless access and get online. That would be really good. Digitalization is hoped to solve another big problem for farmers – access to new markets in the cities. Marie Luakindo runs a juice bar in Abidjan. She buys her fruit at the market, but there are always problems with deliveries. The new online platform that brings producers and buyers together could save her from these constant disruptions. The suppliers give us dates when the items will be available, and then due to logistics problems, they're not available in Abidjan. The app could also help farmers to sell their produce more effectively by consolidating information about crop yields from across the country. There could be a shortage of bananas in the north of Ivory Coast, for example, and overproduction in the south. So our idea is to allow farmers in the south, where there's an overproduction, to be able to sell their products in the north. It will take time for the virtual market to function well nationwide. Agricultural entrepreneur Walter Yaukofi doesn't want to wait that long. He organizes training for young people who want to help the country move forward with digital agriculture. When young people on social media see others like them who went to school and got diplomas but then returned to the countryside, to this land that feeds people, I think that will create jobs. He hopes to create a real community of networked organic farmers across the country. Food grown organically is certainly a healthy option, but people who spend their working day on the go often rely on a quick fix when they get hungry. But as we know, most snacks and fast food, whether healthy or not, are wrapped in plastic or served in styrofoam containers, which, by the way, will never ever decompose. Hold on a minute, Sandra. You are talking about the past and the present. Now let's take a look into the future. We're about to get a taste of things to come. A UK-based startup has created some amazing and mouth-watering packaging materials. Here is this week's Doing Your Bit. Pizza boxes, single-use cups and other packaging waste spill out of trash bins in many cities. Each year, 180 kilograms of packaging waste are produced per capita in Europe alone. One remedy with a lot of potential comes from the ocean, seaweed. The plant-like algae, which can grow up to 60 metres, is common along coasts the world over. It's the material the UK-based startup Nopla chose to make sustainable packaging. Just how they do it is a company secret. But they've even developed a revolutionary way to encapsulate liquids in an edible bubble. Just imagine all those single-use cups at sporting events or parties could be replaced with something that's convenient, compact and sustainable because algaes are among the fastest growing organisms on the planet.
some of the seaweed that we uh, use in the lab grows up to a meter per day. So it's a very, very renewable resource. It doesn't require any fresh water or fertilizers. So unlike any form of agriculture, we don't have to add anything as humans. Um, it doesn't compete with food crops. And lastly, it's very biodegradable. The possibilities seem endless. Seaweed can be used for clean, single-use packaging or as dissolving liquid soap dispensers, and much more. It was for these innovative ideas that Notfar was presented the 2022 Earthshot Prize in the category Build a Waste-Free World. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Just imagine life without single-use plastic bottles, bags, cutlery or packaging. It would change our world completely. Take rivers for example. A lot of people depend on their waters for agricultural as well as domestic use. But many are now chronically polluted which has devastating consequences for biodiversity and communities living along their banks. Limiting the damage can be both difficult and tedious, as we'll see in our next report from South Africa. Piles of rubbish, washed up heavy rains. It's a common sight in densely populated areas along the Henops River. This spot is just a few meters from Thembiza Township, home to more than half a million people. Our children play around here and we buy food that is sold just next to the river here. And then that food is contaminated. Everyone is getting sick of which is not a conducive environment for us now. It's not safe. Representatives from the South African NGO Fresh take stock of the devastation. Their mission is to restore the Henops River and its surrounding wetlands with the help of volunteers. We're just a few kilometers below the source of this river. This is beautiful fountain water. It should be crystal clear, but it's incredibly polluted. If we don't pick up this trash, no one's going to pick it up. With effectively no waste collection system here in South Africa's second largest township, locals simply dump their garbage on the already existing piles. Residents say the river has become a communal rubbish bin. Like the place does it is not cool, it's not good at all. Like you know, free, you know. So yeah, I think we need to ask people who's gonna clean it like now and then, you know. Yeah, we need change. Yeah. Today the team from Fresh wants to inspect one of their litter traps. Four have been installed on the river's upper course. The NGO has invented its own traps. They are constructed from thick wire cables woven through nets and filled with recycled polystyrene. The contraption is anchored on either side of the river. It mostly catches styrofoam in the floods. Um, it also works as a sediment trap to, um, to slow the water down, so it sediments out a lot of sand here. And that sand also serves as a home for beneficial organisms. It prevents further erosion too. The source of the Henops River is situated east of Johannesburg. After leaving the urban areas behind, it meanders through fields and valleys until it eventually joins the Limpopo River system. It later ends up in the Indian Ocean. This intricate system of waterways supports millions of people in both South Africa and three neighboring countries. This river is an important source of drinking water it's also vital for agricultural crops. Farmers like Johann Steinberg are very concerned. Sometimes the river is, is get totally black because of the sewage. It's very bad for us. We uh, worried about uh, phosphor in the in the water. It uh, go into the ground. It go into the crops, and I don't think it's healthy for the ground. It's also not healthy for people. And that's not all. Large amounts of raw sewage are spilling into the henops. Water samples are tested for E. coli bacteria to assess fecal contamination. Near the river source, 
E. coli concentration has been measured at 100,000 times above the accepted limit. So Fresh is now pushing to get the river landscape officially declared a nature conservation area. As a protected biodiversity corridor meandering through the most urbanized areas on the continent, it would help to revitalize South Africa's industrial heartland. On Earth Day, a group from Fresh set out to demonstrate to the authorities the potential of a cleaner river system. They returned the litter trap on a mission to remove 60 tons of waste from this spot in one day. 15 volunteers from the local community were paid 20 euros each, plus lunch, for their efforts. Bit by bit, the waste was carried off to a collection point to be transported to a nearby landfill. It's beautiful, the river's breathing. I think the whole wetland is looking much better. I think we can, we can restore this place. It's a wetland area, so if it gets polluted, and then we, indirectly we are killing ourselves as well because we, this water won't be able to sustain life and sustain us. So we depend dependable to this water system. Another example of how, when added together, the significant actions of individuals can create huge problems. If I toss one plastic bottle into a river, it may not seem like much. But what happens when hundreds or millions of people do it? It becomes overwhelming. So true, Chris. That is why it is so important to help our kids learn to take responsibility for their local environment from an early age. In Rwanda, an expansive program has been launched that encourages youngsters to take an active interest in nature and its preservation. Oh, oh, oh. These youths belong to an environmental club. It teaches them about wild animals in the hopes they'll help protect species diversity and promote peaceful coexistence between people and their fellow creatures. You have to protect the environment surrounding you, but also when you find an animal in the community, you can advocate for it. Don't kill the animals, don't disturb or cut the trees. Always think that when you are protecting, the environment, trees, animals, you are protecting yourselves. Nyungwe National Park is a treasure trove of biological diversity. 1,068 plant species have been counted here, and many of these grasses and trees are found in any other forests or parks in Rwanda. But it's not just the greenery that's unique. The park is home to 322 species of birds alone making it a great spot for bird watching. Back at school, they learn more about what they've seen. This project is part of a Rwandan government initiative. And you guys, you, the members of the environmental club, you are the future of this country, which means that teaching you, educating you, and having you taking a step to conserve, that is the promise of the future. The pupils take their mission seriously. They are assuming responsibility for the environment by preserving its plants and animals. Our mandate in these environmental clubs is to be right on the front line for environmental protection. It's unacceptable for people who harm the environment to be left to their own devices. They must be shown the right way or reported to the authorities if they refuse to change. With more than 400 people per square kilometer, Rwanda's population density is very high, so folks keep encroaching on nature. So, on weekends, school groups visit villages to spread their message. Care for wild animals. Don't set traps or chop down trees. Often, they propose a trade. Villagers can receive farm animals in exchange for giving up hunting. I used to hunt antelope and eat them with my family. But through this awareness and the opportunities offered to us, I've stopped poaching. Since we've been given domestic animals, there's no need to hunt in a park. 
Just seven of Rwanda's 30 districts take part in the environmental club project. But that could soon change. Youths make up some two-thirds of the country's population, so their help is key to preserving species diversity. What a terrific project. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us on Eco Africa. And do be sure to come again next week. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Chris Elems. Looking forward to seeing you again next time, Chris. And that goes for you too, our dear viewers. In the meantime, as you know, you can always check in with us on all our social media platforms. I am Sandra Twinovdio. Bye-bye and take care.